I'm Austin Ganyu. Um, I'm an SE like Will. Well, Will is a developer advocate, but uh, we kind of both serve some of the same function when it comes to mobile, trying to get the message out there, that sort of thing. Um, and so we're going to talk, uh, you've already heard the 101 and the 102. This is the 103 about peer-to-peer. -peer. Uh, so we'll talk about building a peer-to-peer -peer app with Capture. We're just going to kind of run through what that means. Um, we've got a little bit of an agenda here, but essentially, you know, what peer-to-peer -peer is. Uh, you guys are already familiar with kind of what peer-to-peer -peer is to a degree. We'll, we'll go into it a little bit, um, but we, we're going to kind of go fairly quickly through those. And then peer-to-peer uh, -peer with Couchbase Mobile and what that replication architecture looks like. And then, uh, of course, implementing peer-to-peer. -peer. Um, this particular set of demos that I have uses uh, iOS, so we're going to be looking at uh, using Bonjour, basically, MDNS. Um, now, for Android, it would be network service discovery. So we do work with both of those protocols, but for the purposes of our demo, we're going to look at um, <coughs> um, And then, of course, direct pairing. Uh, I've got two demos. One is the app that uh, Will just mentioned, right, the Grocery Sync. And then uh, the follow-on is a what we call Photo Drop. It's essentially a photo sharing app that uses a QR code uh, for um, basically actually pairing devices to share data. That adds a level of security into, uh, into the mix. So just a, a quick review on peer-to-peer. -peer. What is it? Well, essentially, uh, you don't need a server, right? I, I can just communicate with another device, and then uh, I don't need any internet necessarily, so I don't even have to really have any other network except the one that I establish with any other device near me that could involve a server. It doesn't have to. Uh, you know, it's fairly straightforward. Um, some of the benefits, uh, just to be quick about it, but uh, developers don't need to run servers. Uh, it's pretty straightforward. I am able to start up a, my app on the device. I can communicate with other devices, and in essence, we're servers and clients at the same time. Uh, there's an amount of privacy that goes along with that, right? I can just share data directly with the individuals or, or devices that I want to. And then uh, I have as much bandwidth as I like as well. So it's just a connection. I'm just sending the data uh, as best I can, as quickly as I can. And some of the uh, capabilities of peer-to-peer uh, -peer, um, is that we have a cellular, we can be used in the place, like we're talking about cellular cellular dead zones. Gosh, my not working. Uh, that is, I don't need a network. We already talked about that. If I don't have internet, that's okay. If I don't have cell signal, that's okay too. I'm still able to continue to uh, use my app because I can write data because I've got, you know, in the case of Couchbase Lite, I have a database there. But then also for synchronization purposes, I'm continuing to get that data. I can synchronize with other devices, people that I meet on the street, that sort of thing. Um, you know, for instance, like the UN uses us uh, when they, we talk about different areas throughout the throughout the world for being able to just simply synchronize data back to a centralized location, like a tent or something like that, but they don't have any internet access. They sort of have a server, maybe somebody's laptop or something like that, and they're just synchronizing back with Couchbase through Sync Gateway um, for, on one hand. The other hand is that they're synchronizing here to here with the other devices like an iPad, and everybody else has uh, cellular phones or something like that. Wilderness, uh, you know, obviously that's pretty, uh, pretty self-explanatory, but thinking like forest service, perhaps, something like that. They're out there in the wilderness, they're uh, cataloging trees, land, uh, grid coordinates, that sort of thing. They're able to collect that data and then, of course, share it. Uh, who's done what work so far? Uh, and disaster areas, uh, again, you know, not just to mention the UN, but like Doctors Without Borders, things like that. They have approached us about the same kind of thing for being able to uh, synchronize data between themselves for patient records, so that way it stays local, and then eventually someone can synchronize with the server later on. Some of the drawbacks, though, uh, very simply, it's less reliable, um, you know, to a great degree, right? I may have to retry some things, stuff like that. Uh, it can be hard to secure uh, or securely identify who's sending me the data uh, because I'm not, I don't have any primary source of truth or authentication. Everybody's a source of truth in that network. Uh, and then scaling it, right? So on a LAN, I have to be concerned with uh, kind of the sprawl of those connections, and so that there's a large amount of bandwidth consumption, even in peer-to-peer. -peer. Think BitTorrent or something along those lines, where I'm, I just I want as much as I can get, and the more peers I add, then my uh, problem about how to manage that growth uh, kind of goes exponential. And then outside the line, of course, the connectivity, peer discovery, who's out there, who's allowed to access what, who am I sending to, and then managing all those connections. So uh, that kind of leads us to a hybrid approach, being able to communicate um, peers back to a server. So for instance, I've got some uh, 
uh, blue devices on the far left there, they're talking to each other, they're also talking to the central source, the server, and I've got a green device, he's kind of by himself, he's not really peered with any other devices, but he is connected to the server, and I've got a couple of other devices on the right, they're just sitting there, they're talking to each other, they're sharing data, and then eventually I'm able to connect back to the server, and now that's sort of eventually how this data becomes more consistent over time uh, in, a, in kind of a hybrid approach. Um, and essentially making that server just a well-connected peer with the rest of the infrastructure. So peer-to-peer, -peer, oops, that's a good one. No, I think that's it. Peer-to-peer uh, -peer with Couchbase. So um, Couchbase Mobile is built on the CouchDB architecture. For, and so that allows us to do things like revisioning, multi-master, replication, that sort of thing. Um, but it's also designed, because it comes from CouchDB, for arbitrary topologies. That means I can have pretty much any kind of uh, approach to topology, like the hybrid approach, for instance, or I could just have a mesh network, things like that. I'm able to be very uh, very broad with my application, and all it really requires, uh, no matter what I'm connecting to, is that I have an active replicator, and then I have a passive uh, client out there that's able to uh, either provide me something, or uh, you know, it's going to run essentially an HTTP server to for that REST API, and I, I can request from it. But the replication needs to happen in the in the active way. But this is all that's required. It doesn't matter what those devices are; these are the primary components. So just conceptually. And if you're already familiar with peer-to-peer, -peer and you're thinking replication or mobile, uh, and you're thinking replication. Uh, there's just a quick note in there about uh, how our replicator for mobile is not the same as Couchbase XDCR. Um, that's different because it's uh, about the server-based replication, which is not what we're talking about when we're talking about mobile. This is really just about these individual documents with vision and things like that, and Couchbase Servers XDCR is not that. So what kind of topologies uh, are we talking about? Well, a lot of times what comes to mind for most folks is the star topology. It's a very common topology. We've got a server, uh, and, and in fact, a server could actually be, uh, it's, it's in a data center in a data center somewhere. You don't know exactly what is over there, you just know you connect up to an endpoint with your device and you know, iTunes, iCloud, that kind of stuff, uh, you know, even the Google Play Store, right? It, it's an endpoint somewhere that I'm connecting to to get stuff. Well, when I zoom in on the data center a little bit, there's actually, you know, essentially a number of servers back in there operating almost as peers, right, in their own topology that these other endpoints are connecting to to transfer data and even potentially share that between each other. And incidentally, uh, the couch in CouchDB stands for this cluster of unreliable cheap hardware. So very important from a, uh, uh, a history lesson perspective, but the reason that CouchBase and CouchDB exist is for from this reason that uh, you could take these components and put them together to create something uh, that was much more reliable than one piece by itself. And so we build off of that uh, capability. And then we uh, can go the other direction. So we've talked about something a little bit more organized. Now we're going to go talk about something a little, a little less organized, which is about just that mesh topology. Um, and you know, it's, it's very simple to say, but you know, I've got a number of devices out there. Uh, they don't really have any of their own management. They're just kind of talking to each other. So replicating documents, uh, I've got device A and B. Device B has a revision, uh, in this case revision two, and device A has revision three. Now, the basic concept is that he's got a document, he's got a document, he's advertising, uh, uh, device A is advertising his document, uh, and saying, hey, I've got a different revision. Device B sees that, he says, hey, that's new, and then I'm gonna go ahead and get it. It's, it's kind of that simple, especially with when we're talking about Couchbase and Couchbase Mobile. It's pretty straightforward. We're working off of revisions. Um, doesn't mean that you can't have maybe multiple threads or something like that, but at the same time, uh, this is the primary mechanism for identifying what's changed up there and then, of course, getting it pull and push. So what does that mean to us? Well, I've got a document on a device out there, especially when we're talking about a mesh topology, uh, and I want to go ahead and get replication going. So I, he's advertising that I'm out here. Other folks have seen me. They've peered with me, perhaps. And then I'm going to go ahead and spread the, the data around because they all start talking to each other and, hey, I've got this revision, great, that's really, you know, that's what I need, I don't have that revision. And then there's this guy all the way up here that hasn't received a revision yet, and that's because 
He just hasn't seen that everybody else has updated. But then as soon as everybody else has updated, he's not connected to me, he's just connected to another peer. He also gets that, right? So I think we're kind of beat the peer-to-peer uh, -peer into the ground a little bit with this, but the point is that eventually that data will get to the uh, all of the uh, participants of that mesh network. Now the problem with mesh networks, especially if they're naively implemented, is that I have the, this order of n squared problem. So I've got like a number of 20 connections here. You can see that as I connect to from one to an, a number of others, it begins to really expand the amount of management. And we're not just talking about the data that gets pushed around, this is also the metadata, right? I'm here, I'm here, I'm here, I'm here. These messages get, uh, without even you know spreading data around, uh, or documents, uh, is talking uh, across each other. And that just generates a little bit of a, of a headache in terms of the resources required to manage these connections and kind of maintain what that mesh is doing. So there's some uh, better to technologies, a little bit some more advanced things that we can do, uh, primarily around this uh, second bullet about uh, limiting those connections, right? And so spanning trees is one way. It's taking this order of n squared and just deciding what is the optimal number of connections I need to simply transmit that data to the appropriate host. So everybody's got it, and then I just need to pick five out of those to actually uh, get the rest of the job done. Um, and that's, that's a decision based. Now, there's a gossip protocol as well. And what that's going to do for you is that's essentially an eventually consistent model where I'm polling people, you know, others, other nodes or clients within this mesh to figure out, are you okay? Do you have what you need? Are you okay? Do you have what you need? And eventually the data gets spread around. So it is fairly reliable from that perspective. It just takes kind of a long time, uh, depending on how it's been implemented. But they are fairly consistent. So does CouchBase do that on that? No. These are, these are other technologies in order to limit the order of n squared problem. So these are, doesn't do this. We don't do that, no. Because we have a little bit uh, different capability from a peer-to-peer -peer perspective. Could you implement something like that? Yes, but obviously there are pitfalls, right? So you want to kind of watch out for those things. Now, um, when we talk about what CouchBase uh, Lite is doing from, from a peer perspective, we like to choose a little bit better uh, path in terms of how we do this enable those connections. Now through something like Bonjour, right, it's MDNS, we have the capability of uh, observing who's out there, but you could limit uh, by uh, bandwidth number of posts. You could limit the list, essentially. Right? You don't have to look at everybody on the list, you can just choose the first five, or whatever you observe. And then as different devices observe different devices, not everybody's going to necessarily have the same five, and eventually everybody will get the data that's been spread out because, hey, I've got the data, I've got a revision, you've got a revision, yeah, okay. <coughs> and you start to share that. And that's just if it was a naive mesh, right? That's the, basically the problem with naive meshes. It just, it, there's, there's management involved in that. Uh, so implementing peer-to-peer, -peer, uh, first we want to allow connections. So it's pretty straightforward. Uh, <coughs> essentially, the idea from a Couchbase Lite, just the library perspective, I'm going to link it into my app. It, that's pretty straightforward. And then we're going to start a listener, and at that point, our devices become a replication server. So it's not overly complicated, it's fairly simple, but uh, this is just the, the method that we're going to employ. And so how we're going to do that is Couchbase Lite is uh, the data store itself, right? We've instantiated a database, we have our Couchbase Lite API, we've got the app up above, and then we're going to hang off of it that uh, REST API port, an open port for somebody to uh, uh, send and receive data. And then we have our replicator object out here, another device on the, on the, that I've observed or is on the network, and then he's going to go ahead and just send me the data. It's pretty much that simple. And so how do we allow those connections? So um, you know, this is written in Swift. It depends on what, you, what your background is. Um, you know, if you're Objective-C, you might be confused. If you're Android users, you may be confused. But basically, we've got a listener object, uh, and we instantiate that. We've got the database manager and a port that we open. Uh, and then, of course, we set the listener itself to read only because we don't want just folks to start dumping data in without any kind of handshaking first. Or, uh, you know, I mentioned we're going to use Bonjour, uh, so I have a quick demo that I can show. And uh, I'm going to explicitly choose that I'm going to allow the sharing to happen. But in order for me to um, uh, kind of make sense of the world, I'm choosing a port here. Now, you could not choose a port if you chose to and just let it assign something. The issue with that is you don't always know what that port's going to be, and therefore as I uh, do discovery, 
um, especially with Bonjour, I'm going to uh, then see this uh, device and it's essentially a new device. Uh, and I'll, it'll keep popping back up over and over again. So you want to limit that kind of chatter and just choose a, a port. That's a simple way to do it. Uh, the next part um, is going to be actually doing the discovery. And so, in essence, we want to do something fairly simple here. Uh, this is just an example of what a, a little bit of bonjour might look like in terms of the message passing or what's advertising out on the, out of the network. Um, but basically, uh, I want to get a list of who's running what service. And so, when I advertise, I have a few different items uh, that are circled over here, but that's the type of service that I am. Uh, advertising for uh, the name, my name, or the service name, or the MAC address, or whatever, uh, the address, my IP address, and a port, and uh, some amount of metadata. Uh, we could use a timestamp uh, in this particular app, but we're going to use a sequence, and there's a reason for that, and we'll get to that in a little bit. And then similarly, we can browse uh, for the same service type, right? So I'm advertising a service as an app that's running on the network. I'm also going to browse for that same service so that I can add it to the list and know who I'm supposed to sync with. Uh, just a quick note on uh, multicast or a DNS or MDNS, so bon, aka Bonjour. Uh, it can also be implemented on uh, uh, Linux and uh, Android. Uh, so zero conf is kind of the common thing for uh, Linux, so Vahi, and then network service discovery if you're familiar with Android uh, already. And these are written in RFCs uh, in case this is interesting to you. Uh, but then I think the more interesting part is that it can also be implemented on Windows. We've got a couple of uh, links here as well for being able to uh, implement not only network service discovery um, and uh, MDNS, but uh, you can look up the MDNS responder over at uh, Apple.com. And so we want to advertise a service, like I was mentioning. And so we uh, set our bonjour name. So we've already established a listener. Now we're just kind of building <coughs> the code. Uh, we set the bonjour name. So I've provided a nickname. In this case, we say user nickname, but you know it could be a device or whatever. Uh, and one point of note is that um, there might be more than one Joe on the network or more than one uh, Apple device on the network. So how about I go ahead and append a, a numeric value or something like that to this example? Because what I want to do is you know, I want to know who's out there, but I don't want to overlap with anyone else and maybe get replaced uh, in somebody else's list. And just a, a quick point of note, on Android there is no uh, set bonjour name, but you can use the uh, NSD service info class. And you can just implement that, it basically does the same thing. All right, uh, and then browsing for peers. So we talked about advertising, now we're talking about browsing. Uh, so I want to search for services, and this, the type that's listed here is the same type that I already uh, own, right? So I'm an app myapp.tcp, uh, and then we're going to use the domain with local. Uh, and then I have two functions that are really important to this, uh, which is the uh, net service browser uh, did find service, and then did remove service. And all this is doing is enabling us to build our list and uh, as we see new peers come onto the network, and then they'll also be removed as they leave. But we want to have both of these in there, so that way we can actually uh, you know, maintain the list a little bit efficiently without uh, you know, just kind of seeing everybody and, there, and this list grows and grows. We want to make sure we're account, uh, accounting for both actions. Uh, and then connecting to the peer. So when we actually make a connection, we need to know who they are. Uh, so maybe we're just going to do a quick resolution. We've got uh, a resolve with timeout. Very simple, honestly. So like a five second timeout doesn't have to be very long. Uh, and then we have this net service did resolve address. That will return to us uh, something like the, the uh, I believe the host name dot local. Uh, very simple uh, in terms of what it is that we're going to consume, but then we're going to we're going to use that as the host name. So when we build out the URL to connect to, because that's the part that we're on now is about connecting to the host. In this case, it's a pull replication like at the bottom. As we build out that URL, I've got HTTP, I've got the service host name, uh, and the service port. And then uh, the path, and of course that's going to be the database name, and I may, I might advertise that. Of course, if it's the same app, it should be the same database across across different apps. So we can just uh, consume that. And then once the URL has been constructed, we tack that onto uh, the local DB uh, pull replication. That's also pretty straightforward from what we offer in our code. This is the same whether it's Android or iOS or whatever. Um, I believe most of these functions are identical. Well, thank you for pull replications. 
So this is just setting up the replication, but I would authenticate before, yeah, because I know the starts. In this example, I would all have already done that. So either I add in the list that we created, and I chose them, which is what I'm going to show first, that uh, there's no authentication. I, I see you in the list. I'm going to choose you, say I want to follow you, for instance. That essentially lets me subscribe at that point to your database, and then we're, I'm just going to follow whatever changes that you make. But there is no authentication about you made it, I made it, somebody else. There, it just continues to transfer. So that's one app, one demo. And then the next demo is more about the authentication. And that actually, I mean, with the QR code that we'll show, you have to do that prior to any transfer happening. And so using the Bonjour service uh, to replicate, we advertise the UUID, which is pretty straightforward. Um, and you know, we've kind of got the, an example of that down there at the bottom. Uh, we've got the uh, sequence information. The interesting thing about this, this is actually comes out of the latest um, of the database uh, uh, function, right? The DB latest sequence. So what I'm doing is I'm publishing my latest sequence with my uh, device information. And if I'm connected in a peer-to-peer -peer network I, uh, and I increment the documents for any reason, the sequence changes. What that says to anybody else out there observing me is that there's been a change and I might need to do a full replication. So it's a really simple way to uh, signify to everybody else that there's a change and I want to go ahead and, and send data or you want to maybe come get some data. You could use a timestamp or something, but the sequence is something that always increases. Whereas uh, if you use a particular timestamp, uh, you know, and you go offline, something like that, you could, you could pause it, whatever. The sequence ideas uh, come directly out of the database. And so I'm going to remember, uh, as part of this list though, I'm going to remember that UUID and the sequence ID, so that way I can continually look up that information. And then whenever anything changes, like it says at the bottom, I'm going to start a roll. So that leads me uh, to my first demo, if it all goes well, we'll see here in a moment. Let me run this guy over. I'm going to have to resize this one, so thanks. We'll see what happens here. All right, so this is that grocery sink app that uh, <coughs> William was talking about a little bit ago. And you can see I've got my iPhone 6 Plus running the same app over here. Uh, I have to look at that. And so uh, if I were to make a change, provided that my uh, Android device here that I'm tethered to actually works, uh, I can go ahead and add a new task over here, and you guys should observe that it updates there. Well, we may have to we'll wait a moment. And there goes the task. And then I, I want to maybe uh, check some other things off and uh, get rid of one of the other tasks. So eventually it's coming through. Sorry for the latency. <coughs> but this is happening peer to peer. So I've got my emulator running, and then you can see task one disappeared. And I've checked off some of the other boxes. And I could also go in here and add you know, task four. So, I mean, pretty simply uh, set, and then I have task four at the top here with the uncheck box. So, um, it, these are two devices, for all intents and purposes, uh, that are talking to each other, just purely over a <coughs> network in this case. I have a discrete network right here that they're connected to, but they see each other. I've subscribed to them with the follow up here, so then any changes that happen on one or the other, I'm replicating in both directions, because right now they're both selected so that way they can see each other. But the thing that's uh, a bit of an issue, oops, let me go back over here. Uh, but, you know, what's wrong with that demo? And one of the things that we talked about just a moment ago, or a question that came up, was uh, that there is no authentication in this particular uh, demo. I just choose somebody out of the list and say, hey, I want to follow whatever's happening. So that's kind of important, I and mean, it's a very simple way to just run an app, and it's actually very useful, but it doesn't allow us to have any security around that data. So what does this not prevent? Well, it doesn't prevent any forgeries, number one. So that device A over there is sleeping, and he's already connected to another peer on the network, and device B says, I'm, I'm a good guy, and here, the, uh, device C, I've got a, a document, but device C has no choice but to believe that that came from device A. So what do we do about that? Well, we have no servers, right? So there's no central tr uh, authority, uh, and then there's no trust, right? So we don't know if the data is for real. Uh, we can't really use SSL. That just secures the channel, but that doesn't prevent the 
uh, document issue that I just described. HTTP authentication doesn't really do anything for us either because A has to authenticate to B and B has to authenticate to C, but there's nobody connecting A and C together because they don't know about each other. And then, uh, but lastly, I can authenticate the data itself. Um, and there's a couple of ways of doing this, but essentially using digi digital signatures. Um, let me check time here real quick. Uh, so every device is gonna generate a key pair. That's kind of vital in order to make this happen because I'm gonna wanna handshake off of that key pair. Um, and then every revision can be signed. I mean, that is a, just a simple, great way of making sure that uh, the data is accurate and not uh, valid from a specific source. And then to validate the revision, we've got a couple of steps here, but essentially, uh, I gotta validate the signature, uh, look up the author's public key, and of course we're sharing this on a peer-to-peer -peer network, so that's fairly easy to do, and then I'm gonna compare the signatures. Again, on a peer-to-peer, -peer, pretty straightforward to go, uh, to do. Um, traditional style would be something like, I uh, have a trusted authority, so I've got a server out there, or CA root, something like that, um, and then a server would, as a centralized authority, would distribute those keys or those certificates to whoever needs them. And peer-to-peer, -peer, um, as I mentioned, we're using uh, self-signed cert, so it's just a raw key uh, or cert. It's pretty straightforward. Um, and then um, users are going to have to pair. And I've got an example of this as well, but we're going to trade keys via QR code in this particular demo. So implementing peer-to-peer, -peer, we have this uh, app, and this, the source for this as well is over on GitHub, and I have a link to it at the end. But it's called PhotoDrop. Essentially, I'm going to take uh, I'm going to create a document with an attachment, in this case a photo. Uh, I'm going to go ahead and peer or uh, handshake with my uh, emulator uh, from my device here, and then I'm going to transfer data over to it um, uh, because we traded keys, we set up our connection, and then we're going to allow that transfer. So uh, just a couple words on the implementation. Uh, I mentioned we use QR code. Uh, technically for peer discovery. As we saw before on the network, we could look, kind of look at each other uh, and see that we're there. In this case, we're going to provide all resolution information about the other host, everything, all through that QR code, including the key. Uh, we're gonna generate a one-time push replication. Uh, it uses digest authentication, um, but it, that is only one time for the purposes of this demo, so when you exercise with the demo itself, with the code, you can see how you can implement it in a very simple, secure way by just uh, using one-time code and then it'll regenerate every time you want to send something. Or you could go ahead and uh, generate a more longer-term key if that was m more appropriate for the platform that you were trying to, or the purpose that you were trying to send the data. And then <clears throat> this demo also supports iOS and Android. I will point out it doesn't sync between iOS and Android. <laughs> the app ju just is mainly for convenience uh, depending on what platform you, you develop for. Uh, just a quick mention on the storyboard, essentially we've got two, two different sets of uh, segues. One you know, is a send, one's a receive, uh, or ends in the send controller, the ones uh, for the receive controller, they have a little bit different padding. One uses the camera, the other one displays the QR code. So we're gonna start a listener, we saw something like that before. Uh, we're requiring auth in this particular case, right? So we've got an extra uh, piece of information that we didn't have before. <coughs> we are uh, setting a username and password. And the username and password, if you'll notice, is a uh, generated key on both of those. And we're storing them as the form of those things. Now, when we send the username and password, we're actually uh, going to use uh, the QR code um, to, uh, as a representation of that data for when we send. But we are gonna set that on our database for replication. So in essence, I'm gonna hand you a key, username and password in this case, that's encrypted, you're going to basically log into my database with that information. Uh, observing for changes, because we're waiting for data to come in when we actually do uh, the receive controller, uh, it's kind of straightforward, but we have uh, this uh, database change right here. So we're waiting on a notification something's been modified, and then we're gonna save the image. Okay, and then uh, generate the QR code and uh, make the connection. So this is the essentially how it gets appended uh, onto uh, the connection string uh, to my open port. And then similar same, uh, for the view controller, we're going to open the camera, we're going to capture the session, uh, and then grab the QR code and go to 
and then we're going to create, uh, on the receive control, we're going to create the document, right? Because as data comes in, we need something to put it. We've identified uh, the application type, <coughs> and then we go ahead and, and append uh, to the document that we created. And then replicate the documents. Fairly, fairly straightforward. So we'll, we'll do that demo pretty quickly here. All right. Please need my we're going to kill that guy. One second. Fire up the next one. It should fire up here in just a moment. And while that's doing that, I'm going to get a start over here. Let's see if this works. So there's my phone, sorry it's so enormous. Uh, I'm going to choose uh, this pretty cool looking photo right here, and I'm going to hit send. And so that will fire up my camera. You can see my camera kind of moving around there. And then over here on the... Nope, oh, there he is. Man, the thing's enormous. Hold on a second. Whew. Uh, <laughs> Let me change this real quick, my apologies. Uh, all right, so we've got this guy, that's mine, there we go, this one. Let's kind of shrink that down. Okay. So I'm going to scale that guy again. Okay, so here we go, we're going to set it up to receive. If everything goes well, we should be sending the photo, and then right down below, we should see that it comes through. It, it is a little bit slow with uh, the Android device here, I must say, um, but that is acting as my network. If, that, if it all succeeds um, on this network, then you'll see that the uh, photo appears. Uh, I did test this several times, so um, it did work. It was just quite slow, and I'm still. Uh, sending on, uh, on my side. Kill that guy. That doesn't work over there. So we'll just talk about uh, any questions while hopefully this is uh, receiving a photo from my other device. If anybody has any questions, uh, you know, feel, feel free to go ahead and bring them up. Uh, we do have a few minutes left, so we got to do that pretty quickly. Uh, it's just about six o'clock. So, yes. Is anyone using this technology uh, for Couchbase? Um, I don't have any particular customers, customers myself that are using it, but we do have uh, some in the UK that are uh, in EMEA that are definitely doing that. Um, I don't know, Alan. Do you have any that you know in particular employing peer to peer um, right now? I've got a couple of POCs I can talk yeah. about. Maybe, yeah. Um, so there's a couple of event. Uh, coordinators, mm -hmm. right? Um, well, actually, there is one in particular. Um, it's both Couchbase Mobile from a sync perspective, using Sync Gateway and that whole, that whole bit, and then peer to peer also, and that would be uh, Disney Parks. So when you go ahead and get the Fast Pass, they implement both technologies in that because there are sync gateways all throughout the park that they synchronize with, and then if you don't have connectivity, it'll seek out the closest source of truth and then try to get the updated schedules for uh, displaying on the, on the wristband. That's one example. And then there's another uh, company who makes wristbands for special events, and uh, they're POCing with that right now uh, in uh, it's Silicon Valley company. Um, I can't think of the name of it off the top of my head. Uh, I haven't spoken to them in a little while. Uh, but they should be going into more production capacity sometime next year. So again, early stages. For that, but those are the ones I'm familiar with uh, that I've worked with in the past. A lot of folks are using couch base light, but not necessarily as a feature for the future. But this is like a production quality feature, right? I mean, yeah, yeah, it is. This uh, I'm just uh, my uh, network connectivity here and with in this demo is not necessarily no. great, but uh, it is a yeah. Okay. Okay. This is in couch base light today, so you just need to implement the listener and that sort of thing, and you'll have the capabilities built in. Does it work over Bluetooth as well? Uh, not yet, it will be. I'm sorry? 
Do they use like a JSM only for TCP protocol or other protocol can we use? Oh, yeah, so right now, um, I mean, so Bluetooth will be coming uh, if it's not available already with 1.1 that has recently been released. Um, but, uh, I mean, we're not going to, as far as like, you mentioned GSM, yeah. um, that would be kind of hard because of the discovery. I mean, it could work potentially, but there's so many variables between your device yeah. and somebody uh, else's endpoint, right. that could be really hard for discovery. The resolution is probably not going to work, and even if it did, you're not guaranteed to send that data because it, the GSM network is not going to honor your port, right? It, it doesn't care about that. So there's, that's a lot more uh, factor driven than it would be if you were just in the same room and say, hey, over Bluetooth, we're going to do this handshake, I'm going to send you the thing, and we're done. So that's, that's a little bit of a different uh, story. That's a good question, thank you. Anything else? Did you say that you cannot sync between iOS and Android, or is that Right now you cannot, but there is work it, to fix that. Yes, so, so there is an example out on GitHub. Actually, let me go back over to my GitHub. Okay. I will, uh, all right. So that's the URL for the photo drop app. Uh, there is a branch that is working on inter-compatibility between iOS and Android. So if you check out the appropriate uh, uh, branch, you'll be able to uh, test between devices. There is also additional code updates coming. Um, I think you're on the 1.2 release time. Uh, just it's a matter of manpower, you know, to, to work on this particular project for that feature. But that will be it. It will be capable. All right. Uh, hopefully in a couple of weeks, maybe a month, I'm not for sure. So it's soon, I just, I don't have an exact date yet, but within, I would say within 30 days. And that's going to be a great one. We're going to be going, scaling up to, you know, hundreds of thousands of concurrent connections per second, whereas today we're in the tens, right? Peer-to-peer -peer will be a little bit more expansive because of the additional uh, capabilities as well with uh, Pluggability of, of uh, transport, right? Different transport devices that you can use. And you'll be back in New York for the launch, right? <laughs> That's right. That's right. Yeah. Uh, I don't know. Actually, may, maybe Wayne will. <laughs> uh, anyway, uh, that's about it from me at 6:01, and I think it's.